Welcome everybody to our final week of Joyful Momentum Book Club. My name is Nancy Belmont. I'm the Director of Faith Formation for MCCW Worldwide, and I'm joined by author Elizabeth Tomlin, who's also our uh, Finance Director for MCCW Worldwide. So this week, our final week of Joyful Momentum Book Club, we're going to talk about um, Passing the Baton, Mentorship and Accompaniment, which is Chapter 8, and then the Conclusion. And Elizabeth was just like, the conclusion, you know, it's, you're just, we're wrapping it up, but there's a lot of good stuff in the conclusion. I have little, I, oh, I have multiple hearts in my margins, Elizabeth. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it really resonated with me. So we're going to jump right in um, when we talk about, um, one of the main themes of this chapter was, um, the different types of mentorship there are. So um, there's practical mentorship and spiritual mentorship. And you experience that with um, Donna Marie. She was your spiritual mentor. And um, uh, Christina, she was your practical mentor. Could you tell us a little bit more about practical and spiritual mentorship, please? Sure. So, so in any, in any women's ministry, you, you need, you need kind of like, the godmother you know you need you need the person who's kind of like watching out for you spiritually that you can go and talk to and get some some good advice from and some of so i, I kind of think of them as like spiritual mother mothers almost like so some of us have moms we can go talk to some of us don't have moms we can talk to but like everybody needs a mom you know everybody needs a spiritual mom and so you know we can always look to um you know our blessed mother for spiritual guidance and spiritual mentorship and praying the rosary is just a great way to put yourself in her shoes and walk where she walked and kind of seek what insights she you know she has and what intercession she can offer but within our within our women's groups um there are always kind of wise ladies in the bunch or w women who you just notice to be very very spiritual ground very spiritually grounded very devout and those are great people to look to um when you need some when you need some advice or when you're when you're down and need some encouragement or when you are trying to walk the path of holiness to surround your pe yourself with people who um are walking that same path and even whom you admire as as holy people those are the people you want to seek out as spiritual mentors and of course in in any women's group when you have um, work to do, you've got to have um, skills to do it. So you also have these mentors that have taught you the practical and tactical tools you need to get the job done. So um, so in the chapter, I focused on my, my friend Christina, who I actually, I sent her the chapter before I, before the book went to publication, because I was like, would you read this? Is this okay if I publish this? And I sent it to Donna Marie also. Um, and both of them, both of them said it was okay to publish it. And so Christina was our CWOC president at West Point, And she was just one of these girls who's on it, like women who's just on it. And um, she kind of taught me the ropes of um, organizing an event for the parish. And if you're in a military chapel, there's the normal the normal logistics for organizing an event you know reserving the room making sure there's food making sure you've talked to the priest if you want your priest to be present publicizing it and then there's also um you know how far in advance do you have to reserve a room in a military chapel how far in advance do you need to put in a funds request if you have to put in a funds request and having someone walk you through those um, administrative steps is, is so important and to be able to walk, you know, if you're leaving a community to be able to walk someone else through those steps so that the ministry continues is key. So, um, so I talked about them as practical mentorship and spiritual mentorship or accompaniment in the chapter. And I, I think both are equally essential. Well, what I thought was interesting now I have inside information because I was there at West Point with you when you Christina was the president. Yes. One thing that really struck me as I was remembering her is she's younger than us. So to be to be in a mentor relationship, sometimes people say, and you kind of, you said it in, um, when you talked about interacting with Donna Marie, when you were, you knew you had something inside of you that said, I want to write a book, I want to write about my spirituality, but you thought you were too young. Well, 
Christina was just a well-formed, thoughtful, um, she, she, and she's kind of like an old soul. She has, and I think maybe it's because she is in tune with the Holy Spirit and just, she has this peace about her that's attractive to mm-hmm. other people. Um, so she really lives her faith and, and she witnesses her faith without kind of having to talk about it all the time. And yeah, she just, she's able to do practical things and spiritual things. But that's what I really thought of when I read that portion. Sometimes people go, oh, okay, well, I don't, I would really like to find a mentor, but, um, cause I'm young and I don't know a lot, but maybe you know more than you think and you can, um, you can help people out. Yeah, you you know mentors mentors aren't limited by age, um, especially especially when you're talking about um, practical tools. You know if you're if you're a if you're working in a women's group right now and you want to know how to reach young people, go talk to your teenage daughter. Um, they have they have a lot to offer. Um, but Christina, you're right. She's um, spiritually formed, um, just a you know very kind of stable presence kind of low stress, always, always present, always positive and willing to help. And, um, and just had kind of a, it was almost, almost like a St. Therese kind of spirituality, like a little way of, of making things happen in the chapel. And she was, she was younger than me. That's actually the first time I've ever thought about the fact that she was younger than me. So no matter, no matter your age, you can, you know, Mentor, mentorship doesn't doesn't have an age confine. You can find someone younger than you, someone older than you, someone whose background is different than yours. I think just being being open to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and looking for these for these holy relationships is is key to finding good mentors. When you talked about practicing practical mentorship, um, you say on page one thirty four, practical mentorship is especially beneficial as we pass responsibilities to new ministry leaders or assume new responsibilities in a ministry. The entire ministry benefits when experience, expertise, and traditions are passed on from year to year. And it reminded me of when, again, this is where we're going to, uh, Elizabeth and I will talk about how, how long we have known each other. <laughs> Elizabeth and I ran in the same campus ministry circles uh, <laughs> years ago. Babies. And um, so I became the student campus minister at my campus ministry, James Madison University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. And um, what we had there, we always did the discernment in February. And so that gave us like three and a half months to mm-hmm. pass the baton to the next group of leaders. And think about what happens between February and May, Easter. And that was, you know, we weren't around for Christmas um, at a campus ministry, but we were there for Easter. So I had a president, uh, you know, a, a, a um, campus ministry president who guided me through that entire process. So he was like, this is how you reserve the biggest hall on campus, because we had a lot of people uh, come to that mass. This is how you do this. This is how you do all the Holy Week stuff. And so the next year, I was able to do do that. So when I read that, that's what I immediately thought of. And, you know, because sometimes I guess people go, oh, it's too soon. Like, we don't want to do it in February. We feel like we've just, um, we've just basically started the year. Our group is just starting to gel. But yeah. as if this year has taught us anything, it is never too early <laughs> to start um, finding new leaders and developing yeah, absolutely. Um, I love that the campus incorporated that. Um, and I remember, so so my campus ministry at William & Mary was one that had just switched from this whole election thing to a discernment process, which makes me wonder if we got it from James Madison. Do. We're, we're very um, innovative. Do. <laughs> um, so, so, but, so thinking of transitions to build practical mentorship into, into your transitions is so important. Like we talked, we talked earlier about, um, you know, kind of building a bench in ministry. And one of the, one of, I think one, one way to build some practical mentorship in is I like that you selected the leaders early and in, in a campus community, that's key because you, then you've lived through in a, in a chapel community too, because then you've walked through Lent and Easter 
probably first communion season and PCS season um, with some old and new. And another way to build that in, if you don't want to um, select leaders that early, would be to stagger, stagger your leadership team. So if you have someone coming in that you know is going to be there for three years and they would um, want to take a position for two years, you know, maybe you could do that and then you'd have some continuity built in. Um, Fort Bliss had a really interesting way of building continuity. They have, um, they call it a sergeant at arms. They have a sergeant at arms on their board and that person's job is to attend the board meetings, be present, understand what's going on, kind of understand everybody's roles and responsibilities so that if like lickety split, someone has to PCS or deploy, or for some other reason, stop down, step down, the sergeant at arms comes in and has agreed up front to take over the responsibilities of that position, either permanently or until they get someone new um, in place. So it's like they've built a buffer into their, their leadership team. And in doing so, the, the skills and kind of the practical mentorship is just within their board structure, which I think is uh, cool. Yeah, I and I think sometimes these things aren't very difficult. Like I think of First Communion at West Point, when I guess it was last year was the first year I coordinated it and it's not that hard but at the same time it's so much nicer when you have someone who will walk you through the process especially like something that is so meaningful and you like kind of don't want to mess it up and I was so blessed that I had a really experienced catechist who helped me just walk me through and so then I was more confident this year to 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 execute that yeah I mean it's kind of like, so practical mentorship, it's, it's almost like giving some, someone a recipe. Like my family has a favorite chocolate cake recipe. And when you open my cookbook, it falls open. I think I brought you this cake at some point in our, in our friendship, but my recipe book falls open to this cake. And over the years I've made notes about like half, use half the amount of butter, do this, do that. And so, you know, if one of my children, um, wants to come behind me and make this cake like one they've got they've got the recipe but two they've cracked eggs with me and you know, melted the butter with me and creamed the sugar over so many years that it's familiar to them so they can you know carry on the tradition but also um and have have the ability to do so it's not like they're they're doing something totally new and going oh i hope the community's happy with this when um you know sometimes our traditions are what what make our, our CWOC community so unique. But. And I love how you said um, in this chapter, you said um, on 135, in an age of cloud-based storage, sharing continuity files is an easy way for successful, successive ministry teams to keep up the momentum. So when you have those recipes for success, digitize them. So if you don't have someone who's, you know, coming, you know, and, and a lot of times, sometimes with, um, ministries different positions ebb and flow so maybe you had someone who's like super um, super passionate about outreach and did all this stuff but maybe maybe in the next few years you're more into in reach or something and then you have someone with outreach and they're like what are the organizations that we could reach out to in the local community if you have those digital files that's so much that's so great sometimes i get um really intimidate him to me. I found, I found actually a whole bunch of stuff in the, in the most Holy Trinity uh, attic, like, like stacks of files from MCCW Northeast. And it could be a little <laughs> intimidating to get that much paper. So like for me, the digital files where also I can like, you know, find keywords like hospitality. Okay. You know, that's, that's, um, I like that better and it makes the priests happier because they don't have to store all this stuff in the closets in the churches and then you know when you're you don't have you know when you're maybe working out of a closet uh at a chapel or someone accidentally pcs's with the records how many times has that happened with, with the binders so the digital files are key yeah i have um two tupperware bins of mccw files in my basement and i really hope that i'm driving distance <laughs> to the next um mccw finance person because they're going to get a whole <laughs> lot of paperwork <laughs> but i do have good digital files too but yeah there's a whole lot of paperwork down there to, to, for me i just you know i like 
and it and we have to respect too. People have different styles of learning. I work much better when someone is is guiding me through it. It's like if I do it, it's much more effective to me than um, reading about it. So like it's good to have um, kind of think about everybody's different learning style and prepare different different things. Um, so besides talking about practical ministry, practical mentorship, you talk about spiritual accompaniment. And you said on 133, ministry leaders, whether new to this vocation or very experienced, also need spiritual accompaniment. So um, you talk about peer accompaniment and really um, encouraging that in your chapel groups, um, encouraging them to practice peer accompaniment by meeting regularly, forming prayer partners, and hosting social functions in pairs or teams so that accompaniment happens naturally. And then also, encouraging chapel groups to be stay very close to their priest mm -hmm. so the bishops have also advised pastors to maintain a presence in group, group ministries to guarantee suitable accompaniment seek out sisters in ministry to accompany you and ask the pastor for accompaniment so remember in the bible it says that jesus sent everybody out two by two so it's important we need that encouragement we need that um you know sometimes when you're you know i know when i felt discouraged um, ministering in the time of COVID a few months ago, my husband really challenged me to, to look at something a new way. And then he, he really spurred me along doing that. So that mm -hmm. I found that personally helpful during this time. Yeah, I, so at the very beginning of the book, I put a, um, a verse from Hebrews. It, it is, may we always rouse one another to love and good works. And you can't do that alone. You know, yeah. you, you rely on the graces that God gives you, but you rely on your community. Um, so with spiritual mentorship, the the Vatican came out this week with kind of guides, mm -hmm. guidance for parishes. And what, what came first, you know, the first part of this chapter talked a lot about kind of administration. And what the Vatican said was um, evangelization, the purpose of your parish is evangelization. So your focus needs to be Eucharist and evangelizing in your parish. And what I loved about it was they said, um, they reemphasized that your, your parish is, to, you know, historically it's a geographical boundary. And, and often that was because of like travel constraints. It was a lot harder for me to travel from St. Timothy's to St. Rita's across town um, when my two legs were going to carry me. But, but what they emphasized was that your parish boundary includes not just the people who come into your pews, but every person within that geographical boundary is under the pastoral care of that parish, of that pastor, which gives the pastor a lot of responsibility, but to emphasize Eucharist and evangelization as like the two things we've got to be key on. And that spiritual mentorship, if you are walking alongside someone um, Jesus is in there. Jesus is in the midst. And that's what Emmaus, um, the story of the men walking along the road to Emmaus shows us is that Jesus is presence, present in their midst and um, led them, in fact, exactly to the breaking of the bread. So um, so I think if spiritual mentorship focuses on those those two things that the Vatican just, you know, re-emphasized, which sounds a lot like um, the new evangelization, which, which Pope Benedict um, wrote all about what, what the new evangelization is. It's the re-presenting of the gospel to the people already in your community, then that spiritual accompaniment. Um, the Holy Father um, emphasized accompaniment of the poor in our parishes in the document that he just came out with. And I think that's so key because we have um, people suffering around us. You know, right now we've got people who've lost their jobs. We have people who are, um, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit. We have people who are poor in spirit right now because their lives have been upturned. So, um, so spiritual accompaniment always gets, is, is all about the mission of, of what we do. So um, I think it's probably, if you had to say that either practical or spiritual accompaniment were more important, spiritual accompaniment is more important. Mm -hmm. Um, but practical is essential is essential too. So don't think because I wrote about practical first, it was less important. It was probably just easier to write about. So, so um, you, you said that um, I often hear women say they do not have good mentors. So you gave people steps on how to um, get a mentor. 
And one thing that really resonated with me on page 136 was that you said a ministry's ability to hold a Bible study or event should never hinge on the skills or knowledge of one indispensable person. And yeah. that is especially true in a military community. I think, I think it's, I think of it two ways in a military community. It's especially true because that person will not be there in two years. We yeah. cannot develop cults of personality. Um, oh, she's the only one who knows how to do this. But in a civilian parish, that could also be a death knell because then the one, one person ends up doing it for 20, 30 years. And then sometimes that person dies and then nobody has comfort. Nobody knows how to do it. Yeah, the, the Vatican document that just came out talked about um, kind of shielding yourself from bureaucracy in the parish. So those sorts of practices or like, and the other word they used was hyper clericalization of the laity, um, kind of meaning like, is your, is your, are, are some of the lay people in your parish like taking on these, um, well, I, I'm, ki I'm kind of interpreting the term. So like, so clear, you know, when we think of the word clericalism, we think of like treating the, treating, treating pastors like special because they're clerics um, in, and, you know, in, in, in a degree, they are, they are special, but, um, but I think what they mean by hyper clericalization of the laity is like looking is, is kind of these, um, these roles where you, where you do see like the same person has been doing, doing a role in the parish for years and years and years. And it's almost like, like part of, part of the pastoral ministry that can't be, that's like not touched by the rest of the laity. And there needs to be a, a sharing in the responsibility of the parish among the laity. So, um, so we have to be, we have to be integral to our parish. Like our, our parish needs us and we need our parish. We have to be integral to the work of the parish, but we can't be indispensable such that our work can never be replaced by somebody else's work. And I remember one time I was, um, I was stressed out about work and I said something to Archbishop Brolio about it. And he, he said, you know, there are plenty of indispensable people in cemeteries. So I was like, Oh, okay. So it kind of like brought me down to earth that really what I was doing was. Elizabeth, not. thinking of uh, coming down to earth, I actually need to get up for a moment because somebody's at my door uh -huh. and my husband's answering the door as previously answered. So okay, go answer the door. In your life, Elizabeth, talk amongst yourselves. I'll give you a time. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna sip my cough my coffee. I guess I'll keep talking. Okay, I'll keep talking. Ha! Hi everyone. Okay, don't you love when you get like little interruptions from kids and people at the door and families? I when George comes in, I call in my co-counsel. But um, so I'm trying to think what else I said about. Oh, did you get it? <laughs> oh, that was super I just quick. told my husband somebody rang the bell and. Imagine this, the Culligan guy doesn't want to come into a house of five people under 18. <laughs> it's got to <an> offer. <laughs> so I had to accompany my husband to the door. <laughs> but okay, so um, let's see. But as we say, this is real life. And we, we I act all professional on here, but I'm just. Um, We're just I'm moms. Just, I'm just a mom. Just mom's bedroom trying to record a video and there's George. It's 10 40. My kid is in his pajamas. This is like I think it's a 1 40 here and I'm pretty sure at least two of my kids are. <laughs> All right, I love you, but out. Um, and then um, we, we are running long because this is a great topic, <laughs> but I want to bring up before we move into the conclusion that no matter what your role in ministry, seek out women who could succeed you. That um, And then what that brought up in me was, and then name their gifts. If yeah. you see someone who could succeed you, then tell them they could succeed you and why. This is what I see in you. And yeah, so and it's, it's huge. And it's not because they have the same gifts as you. It's because you recognize that they're gifted, how they're gifted, and that they they are they can use these gifts to the service of the community. Yeah. So um well we'll talk more um more about this in our Zoom chat. 
on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll talk maybe a little bit more about, uh, I love resisting the urge to manipulate or control. I put a little carrot in there. Gently lead people. <laughs> if they are doing something maybe that we've done before or, you know, it didn't work or you, you know, gently lead people and don't, um, don't torpedo their dreams or ideas. So, um, so I wanted to talk quickly about the little things I hearted in your conclusion. Um, when you talked about going with Michelle to, when you were in Paris mm -hmm. and you went to two different churches, you were tourists yeah. and you arrived during Spanish mass late and you were not prepared. You weren't going to communion. And no. then the author was like, Hey, time to go to communion. And you said, can I go? And the only, which I, and I, his answer to this, which I thought was also very good was, have you confessed? Yeah, I confessed. And, and mm -hmm. you, you honestly said, because you had gone the day before, yes. And he was like, and he said, well, well then. <laughs> well then. <laughs> and it was, then you were the, the woefully late to mass. I scooted mm -hmm. up the communion line and received the Eucharist in front of the uncorrupted body of Catherine Labore. You received you receive the gift of the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the gift of doing that in front of Catherine, Catherine Labore with your friend, and this, and were you were encouraged by this other person, and then you went to Saint Vincent de Paul Shrine for the, with the Polish Mass. It's right around the corner. Like you, you just, it's like two blocks away. So if you've ever been to Paris, you gotta, you gotta go to both places. And the same thing happened to you. Yes. Because you went up, you went up for a blessing. I mean, and... like this, I walked up there like this. This is like the universal that's American gesture. <laughs> As we stood in front of the priest, we bowed with arms crossed over our chest, reverencing the host. However, as we straighten our postures, the priest said in unison, Corpus Christi. Re reflexively, we said, Amen. Yeah. <laughs> the priest moved the host toward our mouths and we received communion again. With wide eyes and surprised expressions, we returned to our pew for the conclusion of the liturgy. We had not intended to receive. We were tardy, jabbering, enthusiastic American pilgrims who wandered our way into a Polish mass in a Parisian church and yet like men on the road to Emmaus and early disciples of the community of Acts chapter 2, verse 42, God chose us to make himself known to us. So God chose us to make himself known to us in the breaking of the bread. So I wrote my little heart and I said, are, are we open to this? Are we open to these unexpected gifts that God is giving to us? And you said on the next page, I hope that as Michelle and I receive blessing." After unexpected blessing, you too will have the eyes to see God blessing your work and making himself known to you on your path. And, you know, we, sometimes we get tense. How am I going to serve? How am I going to do this? Um, how am I going to, you know, be this for the parish and not, not recognize that God is trying to bless us and God is trying to, um, to give us these gifts, even though when we feel worthy, unworthy, or unexpected <laughs> you know he wants to give us that and sometimes like we have to be cautious of that like you said don't get caught up in the bureaucracy like we did did you confess well yes i did confess i did make my peace with god i did repair my relationship with god well then let the blessings flow don't block the blessings yeah i think when you're when you're looking for the when you're looking for the graces, you see the graces. When you're looking for God's movement in your life, you see God's movement. So um, I was listening to a podcast yesterday and you know how like mindfulness is a big buzzword right now or like buzz practice. So I'm like, I was like, I don't know what this is. I should look it up. So I was listening to this podcast that was talking about mindfulness and it was like, um, Mindfulness is the practice of like understanding where your body is and like sensing the feeling and accepting the feeling and relaxing it. And like, if you've ever done like a breathe, like a relaxation breathing, like it's often like 
you know, feel the sensation in your neck without trying to change it, relax into your pillow or something like that. That's mm -hmm. like what they defined as mindfulness. And then they said, the way you become more mindful is to meditate. And so I was thinking about that in our Christian lives, like our Christian awareness as sons and daughters of Christ walking through this life, like is, I mean, that's, that's our, that's our Christian, I'm going to use the word mindfulness, but like, don't freak out. That's our like Christ, Christian mindfulness, Christian awareness of being sons and daughters of, of Christ, of God. Um, and then the way we practice this is through prayer, through the sacraments, through mass attendance, the way we, the way we um, become more aware of our existence as children of, of God and of God's movement in our lives is through through our, through our increased prayer life, through staying close to the sacrament, um, through through going to mass, and I think this was one of those experiences where, probably in some part because I had just been on retreat, because I had just been to confession, um, because we were in mass, we were looking like we were aware of God's presence in our lives. We were looking for it, and there was like we didn't miss it. It was it, God made Himself very obvious. But had we not been looking for it, you know, we might have missed it. And we have so many opportunities in our women's ministry um, and in our families and our lives to see God's graces, to feel God's graces, to experience God's graces, and we we have to be open to them. So the irony of I'm trying to think of the word for it, like, uh, oh, secular mindfulness is that it can be not very full. It could be kind it's of empty. Neat. It's yeah. my son, Tim, he was in sixth grade and he, you know, we're doing distance learning back in the spring and he had to do these mindfulness exercises because he goes to public school. And Timothy is also a very spiritual child. He's like, he's my kid who like reads the Bible for fun. So he complained to me about this. He's like, mom, this is so dumb. <laughs> So I felt, but he's supposed to do it, you know? So I said, Timothy, and I just, I, I broadcast it through a Christian lens. I said, don't empty your mind of things. Don't just, don't just relax your feet just to relax them. Just like you can relax your feet and like recognize that like God created you and God made those feet and like you can thank God in that moment. And when I yeah. When I took all the things that they wanted him to do and reframed them in a Christian lens, I said, Tim, just use this in a, as an excuse for Christian prayer. And you can, you can, what they're just trying to teach you, they're trying to teach you in a secular way. You're, you're kind of being homeschooled right now. So we're going to put everything through a Christian lens. And he really, it really resonated with him to do that. So um, when we're mindfulness, when we're mindful, of God around us, that's, that's a real fullness. That's the fullness of, of recognizing that God is um, real, alive, and present in our lives. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, I guess we've been chatting for about, ooh, probably over, probably a while. <laughs> we can't stop. So it's our, it was our last one. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we have all of these, our little author chats, archives in our on our YouTube channel, MCCW's YouTube channel. So you can access these for, I mean, they're, they're gonna be on there. So if this fall, you're not sure what you're doing with your chapel group, um, use this, use this as a resource. And if you're available um, every Wednesday during the summer of 2012, 2020, <laughs> we are uh, having these chats about uh, on Wednesday nights in our MCCW group on Facebook. Um, so join us. We have a Zoom link on our MCCW uh, Facebook page. If you go to news, you can find our, our book club. So thanks for joining us. And um, Elizabeth, this has been a really great experience. So it's kind of fun to uh, just chat with a friend. <laughs> and then, then we'll record it for uh, the benefit of everybody. But I hope you all enjoyed our, 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 um, our conversation. So thanks. All right.